Right, another draft physics video presentation. Uh, this one really draft. Uh, subject of magnetism and charge. And um, just going through some of the phenomenon and what might be a possible explanation for some of the, uh, well, what the experiments show, uh, what we can establish as being, you know, in some vague realm facts and uh, how you can make sense out of them. So, um, charge is simple. I mean, it, it uh, you know, it can be understood simply that if you just, you know, do this simple thing where you just say there's two forces uh, in the universe and there's two kinds of objects, electrons and protons, and the two objects inversely relate to the force. So, um, you know, that if a blue goes into a pink or red, uh, it's diverted and there's no momentum exchanged uh, and vice versa for the, the blue object and then if the same color hits that is a blue hits a blue it imposes momentum you know until there's a reflection um, and the object moves uh, you know it uses that force pushes it essentially and uh, so, so and eventually there's a reflection, which is essentially a, it can be looked at either way as a transmission, just because this what's going to counter the force is the counter force, which is going to reflect also. Um, and the net product is is that a force pushed the electron or proton moves from one position to another position, and then the universe is restored, um, essentially. And this means that drag is a real thing for electrons and protons, and that's why we don't have electron and proton guns. Uh, it is because they're not very effective as bullets. Um, but the principle here would be is that would cause uh, this effect where all any energy that came in blue to the pink would leave perpendicular. Uh, likewise, for any energy the opposite and you'd end up with low pressure between the objects and you would have the higher pressure of the natural universe uh, on the outsides and this would be a mechanism that would cause them to pretty dramatically move towards each other and the idea of a reflection between them a force getting caught between them just bouncing back and forth and causing momentum away would obviously create a very strong impulse for the same to um, be repulsive. Um, so this works. Now you can take this model, charged model, and you could say, yes, if I could theoretically make two charges very close to each other, an electron and a proton, I could create a dipole of sorts and I could expect certain behaviors, um, you know, con conditions that would be similar to what a magnet would do. So if I could put a proton and an electron um, next to each other, um, I would create a, a magnet and I could expect that if a, another proton and electron package existed that it would behave commensurate to magnets in the sense that the repulsion would cause this object to have to change this circumstance. It would flip essentially. There would be forces going both ways uh, you know, and the, the, the end result would be the magnet will flip uh, and become attractive and then move right into the other magnet. And so that's all consistent. Uh, all consistent with Maxwell, blah, blah, blah. And so um, the problem comes in when you do this with an actual magnet. So I have an actual magnet that I assume is doing a similar thing. That is the the bottom part is pink and the top part is blue and it's going to behave like an electron here and behave like a proton here so the north and the south will be um, you know uh, that's the wrong label actually um, the north and south idea would just be converted into the electron proton idea uh, the problem is though is if I take a charged object something that has a static charge say of you know 200,000 volts on it um, it isn't affected it's just like it's sitting here saying I'm very electron you know minus 200,000 
it's saying I'm really strong, you know, the same as this one side of the magnet, and yet it doesn't just fly away at supersonic speed and do any of the things you would expect. Um, and um, so there's something else that has to be going on. Um, I speculated that this charge phenomenon had something to do with charging the magnet and then breaking this filter. This is essentially a filter, as I've explained. I mean, what's happening in the universe is this mixed force, you could say purple, is going in in the form of the gravity force, whatever you want to call it, the background radiation is coming in mixed and the magnet is just filtering it. That is, it's sending more blue out this end and more red out this end and uh, reflecting red at this end. So it's all reflecting and it's all transmitting. So it's moving the blue out this end and the, the red out this end. But it's just not quite that simple because of this charge thing. But you can't really charge the the surface without a magnet charging the surface. Why wouldn't another magnet do the same thing then? What's different about another magnet being here and a charged object being here? Why wouldn't the magnet do just as much uh, damage to the filter, so to speak, as uh, something that has a voltage on it? Why the difference? So this sort of relates to the interferometer um, discussion. So the things we know about magnets is that they have a thing called domains. That magnets are really an arrangement of matter, not the matter in its natural state. That you magnetize iron, or you magnetize cobalt, or you magnetize nickel. Is it nickel? Well, whatever the other one is. Um, you know, you have to change the arrangement of the actual atoms in some way to make it magnetic and then you can make it unmagnetic and it's there's no real difference between the material when you look at it and how it functions um, what it what it appears to be doesn't change in any significant way um, between being this and being you know just a blob of of purple and you know so to speak so the difference between this <coughs> you know this and this isn't very can't observe it there's nothing we can observe to see the difference um, <clears throat> so the difference is is just something happens to the little atoms and we sort of understand or the people would say is that that's what this domain thing is doing is, is that all these <clears throat> the big magnet is essentially made out of a bunch of little magnets and the little magnets essentially have to be the atoms and so the atoms have to be aligning in such a way as they're creating a configuration um, that allows for this phenomenon of this segregation. So the, the pattern is built into the atoms or little groups of atoms. So you could say the domains are in here, you know, and they're all aligning and doing something similar. And so there's a pattern that's causing the effect. Um, and so if you take that one step, so compared like to, um, we, we know like interferometers and the two slit experiment, different, you know, the single aperture we'll just use. If I make a single hole and I send light through it, what that hole will do is cause light to create a, a pattern of on and offs, um, you know, a, a fringe pattern of lights and darks, areas where there'll be photons in phase and the places where they'll be broken and not in phase. And it's all kind of dependent on how this thing starts. So you could sort of understand that there's a that pattern. I could have that pattern start with a pink and then I could say, yeah, then it's blue. And then it's pink and then it's blue. And, then, and if I was to convert it into a magnetic model. And if I did that, uh, it would be clearly um, true that there would be a real problem for like say if this was sending out a pattern so it's not like it's completely blue and completely pink what it really is is that this end okay of the magnet sends the pattern with a blue center you know and then a pink um, 
I'm gonna just do pinks with swirly lines. I don't know. It's a little too much trouble to draw all the all the blue and all the pink, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, could be time consuming. Um, yeah, you can see that. Uh, so you get the idea. All right. So that's all I need you to do is get the idea. And so what it's really doing is sending, you could say, little um, little patterns, little blobs like this. And you could understand that uh, I could have this magnet work, and this sort of gets to locking, okay? Because they do have this, you know, when you use these super cooled conductors, um, you can create this phenomenon of, you know, levitation at, at specific heights and you know you can you can create all kinds of weird magnetic phenomenon where things are doing things that you know they just normally don't do um and it, irrespective of gravity okay i mean it doesn't matter which way you do it you can lock them going up and down this way or lock them going up and down this way it's really strange <laughs> and so there's just indicating there's something a subtle a little bit more going on so the point would be is it that this gets rid of the problem of why don't single electrons or small charges are, aren't affected by magnets is because the magnet still is sending both colors and a single charge really can't see the difference it's going to be hit by as much blue as it is red and so it's going to see it as the same because it can't see the pattern now certainly it could, would move based on you know what part it's seeing at any one moment but if it's shooting out like a cone you could sort of understand that there wouldn't be any compulsion to jump okay to the bigger or smaller rings there would be no mechanism that would say oh yes I'm gonna move this way or I'm gonna move that way it would just lock into a ring color and it just stay there um, you know because it couldn't go forward because that means it would go backwards can't go backwards because that's gonna push it forward so it would just be stuck in a position where it's just bouncing in one of these rings. So no matter where I put it, it's just going to lock into one of these rings. Because if it moves forward or backward, it goes into a different color. You can kind of get it. It's getting pushed the opposite direction. So it's always stuck yin-yanging. You can't ever get out of the yin-yang. So that explains why charges find magnets uninteresting. Um, and this would explain why magnets work in the sense that this side of the magnet okay has the blue center this side is creating the pink center okay and you could sort of um you know intuit okay that this is a fundamental kind of problem like even though the patterns would look superficially oh you can't really see the difference right it looks like just something going pink blue pink blue pink blue obviously if i try to place this uh pink one on top of this blue one they would you know the the pink would line up with the blue the blue would line up with the pink it would be very attractive and if i had the same pattern and i was shooting them at each other you could see that it would always kind of there would be no place it could exist in where it could find any symmetry you know where it could line up the bars and it would always be stuck with that middle part that's saying no okay I won't do that okay pink against pink so it's always going to be dissatisfied okay with the arrangement and always find it to be more pink you know more more opposite than um, than neutral and so because of all that misalignment you still have the repulsion so it's uh, it's it's consistent with understanding why magnets can see this pattern charges can't okay the monopole charges can't see the existence of that difference where another magnet can see the difference um, and can have this matching problem where the centers never match you know the centers are always going to dictate um will dictate the by the, the end result of whether you're going to be repulsive or attractive it's going to be dictated by what the center is um because that has everything to do with the alignment there's no place you can align the two there's no place you could mix them 
where you won't have an imbalance because of that imbalance center because the centers are opposite it means the whole thing always has to be opposite there's just no position you could put it in where they could be interested in locking or being attracted or being anything and uh, so the idea of those coming out as cones sort of can explain why there's certain positions for the superconductor where they do have alignment <coughs> and you know the forces balance um, <clears throat> so as an explanation for that so it's uh, you know, I don't um, it'd be nicer if it was you know uh, the the one step simpler where uh, as my original drawings are you know it's all blue coming out one end and all pink coming out the other end but it really isn't that simple it's a pattern of that comes out of the two ends and the patterns are just fundamentally uh, incompatible with each other uh, and it really just has to do about whether a surface um, a charged surface can't really see the pattern because it's just made of electrons. I mean, it's just electrons saying, what's the pattern? What, what's, what am I getting hit with? And the fact is, is from the, the charged object's perspective, it's getting hit with as much pink as it is blue um, over an area of space. So in an area of space, it can't really travel anywhere where it's consistently blue, 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 always blue it's always going to change back to the pink and you know force it in the opposite direction so it's never going to be comfortable um, moving in one direction um, getting anywhere t moving towards or away because it's always going to be changing what it's going to be moving into in terms of a field now the good thing about this kind of diagram is, is that it sort of keeps it consistent that yes both um, the magnet isn't fundamentally changing the field of the universe it's only creating a pattern in it and so there isn't a dramatic amount of difference in the overall field created by a magnet and that makes them that explains kind of why they're so benign to um, gravity and other effects um, it's because it's just about the little hidden pattern and um, you know, only an object big enough can see the pattern first off and um, uh, yeah, and an object that has the same pattern it's producing um, will be affected. And the thing that can't see the pattern is either going to get caught, you know, bouncing back and forth in it, um, or it's, you know, in some other way going to find that it doesn't provide any mechanism for um, uh, pushing or pulling, pushing creating high pressure or low pressure uh, you know based on the simple fact that uh, you know there's two forces and two kinds of matter and this inverse relationship so anyway it does um, it does mean I have to think some more on my magnetic model but like I said it explains a lot of what you see in experiments and it may be um, uh, underlying this explanation may be a better explanation for uh, the motor force, you know, the fact that um, in some circumstances with conductors, see the weird part is, is that um, when they often, when you see a, a beam of electrons, let's say, you know, in a cathode ray tube or something else, what they've done is inject in the vacuum, you know, there's a vacuum that it exists in, and they've injected in the vacuum a gas. And what this that you're seeing really is a plasma. You're really seeing atoms, okay, that are injecting photons because the atoms are constantly changing state. They're constantly going from positive to negative ion. So they're constantly being jostled. And the con that's really the conductor heating up. So you're really just seeing a very weak conductor getting very hot from having, from carrying electricity um, from, you know, a positive to a negative. So you're really not seeing a beam of electrons. You're seeing a beam of electrons exciting a, a conducting material and creating a pathway for the electricity. Um, and you're seeing that pathway, essentially. 
because it's ionizing the gas. Now the gas ions are kind of big atoms and they're magnetically lopsided, you could argue. I mean, that's the nature of the ion is to be kind of a dipole. I mean, a negative ion would kind of be a dipole because in some direction it's missing an electron. <laughs> Um, you know, or if it moves from, you know, I've sort of been over this before, geometrically, you can sort of understand if you go from 4 to 3, you're going to become uneven. You know, from this side and from this side, you're not going to look the same anymore, where you look the same when you had 4. And then if I move to 5, you've got the same problem, you know, where it's going to be lopsided. One side's going to look different, the pentagon, than the other side. Uh, you know, one point of view is going to be weighted heavier than the other point of view um, in terms of electrons and protons. So it's like positive ions might be negative ions, you know, in some sense. From the opposite side, the positive ion can look negative, and from the opposite side, the negative ion could look positive. Uh, but anyway, the point is, is they're polar, I would argue, and that's why they move in a magnetic field. They can see the magnetic pattern and they can move um, they can they can change their orientation to the field they're in um, and that's why you get some weird movement well so the point is is that you know what what you see in experiments is I can bring a magnet you know a south side let's say in to proximity of one of these beams and if it's ions yeah I can move it this way well, actually, I, that's when it moves this way and that way, okay? It moves sideways, so it goes, you know, pushes that way or it pushes this way. And if I, if it's not ions, that is, I don't put a gas in, um, you know, then I can make the electrons drive right into, you know, e either drive away, you know, push away from the magnet, or if it's the north side, you know, crash right into the magnet. So there's two different phenomenons, and the two phenomena look the same, you know, depending on whether I'm crashing the, the beam into a piece of fluorescent material to see where it goes, or if I'm ionizing a gas and causing the creation of a bunch of... Uh, I'm moving the conductor, essentially. So there's one case where you're moving the plasma, moving the conductor, and the other case where you're actually moving the electrons. You know, and those two cases are confused in the experiments because sometimes, well, because it really hasn't been carefully done where you mark experiments based on what gas you put in, whether it's a perfect vacuum, and all of these things are really important to whether the movement is moving atoms or whether you're just moving electrons. Um, and clearly I would argue that none of the experiments indicate you can actually move the force. So, you know, that you can uh, affect a beam of light, for example, or a beam of gamma rays, or any of the uh, x-rays, or any of the real force elements. They never are bent, uh, are moved. So, um, so the idea is once you create a conductor, you create something that's polarized, and now you can move that polarized thing in the magnetic field. So it's like when a conductor, you put electricity through it, you polarize the atoms, and they, you know, the conductor physically moves, um, you know, perpendicular to the magnetic field you create. Uh, you know, so it goes in or out of this field depending on which way I send the electricity. It'll go out or it'll go in, rather than away. Uh, either way. Um, and so that phenomenon kind of indicates it has to be subtly more complex than just, you know, red and blue or plus and minus or uh, electron, proton. It has to be something a little more complicated um, to create the, that third action of moving perpendicular to the field rather than towards in a way. Uh, yeah, so that's the part I still have to work on. Um, but you can sort of deduce it from... Uh, so the, the one 
the step further to go <clears throat> in terms of you know illustrating it would be if I was to try to make physically make a magnet out of little magnets I have to understand that there's a real magnet here <clears throat> right I mean that's the real magnet of the atom and then when I put another one next to it right that oops um, this is the real magnet now this looks like a magnet here right so this piece here hey it looks like a magnet it looks like it's in the opposite direction you know it's going pink blue so this one's going blue pink blue pink blue and this one's going blue pink you know <clears throat> so you got it's almost like you have this wrong oriented magnet in the middle of the right oriented magnet but that's just an illusion because this this is the real magnet here and this is the real magnet here and what you create here is not a real magnet it's not really doing this pattern making conversion thing so that's what you sort of have to understand is when you start stacking these atoms they're going to stack <clears throat> and you're going to kind of understand that the ones next to it sort of have to be the opposite you know they have to be in the opposite orientation but which one is the real magnet right is this the real magnet or will this one be the real magnet right this blue pink so now I've changed another circumstance where okay now <clears throat> you could sort of understand that when they're stacked they're going to be stacked real magnet you know fake magnet real magnet fake magnet if you weren't going to go straight across you'd say fake real fake real fake real um, you know which makes this a little more complicated and then at certain angles it's the point is is that the surface the actual physical surface can't be an atom that facing that way it has to be an atom facing this way so another one where you're another circumstance where you're creating another fake atom on the surface right <laughs> you know it can't a fake uh, magnet um, and you know it's gonna have to be red and then there'll be a blue down here and then you know pink blue and you know you're trying to figure out how can I arrange this so it's always blue pink blue pink blue you know where they're always you can never have two pinks next to each other so to speak so again it's another geometric question of how can I create a surface that appears blue okay because somehow without creating a monopole without somehow having a disconnected electron it has to be an electron bound to an atom that's on this surface here and vice versa you kind of know you can't have a proton really on the surface so you know the inverse one is even harder to create I mean a drawing of but the point is is that you could sort of understand that yeah if it it's going to end up having some kind of features to its surface you know some sort of um, you know uh, well it can't be that really <laughs> yeah it really can't be um, well anyway the surface is going to have to be made out of these polarized atoms is the point and so then when you shine a force on them you can sort of understand that there'll be that this one would dominate because it's sticking out further than the one next to it they can't be aligned perfectly but if I did have to align them you know pink blue pink blue you can understand that if this was a if this was a real magnet this way and this one was one of those fake ones and the real magnet was going this way and this way you could understand that this one could be creating the, the a, a beam that's you know um, stronger and this one would be weaker and then vice versa the next one would be stronger and then weaker you know and, you know so you can think of different ways that pattern could be created out of this thing and obviously it uh, opposing magnet would have the opposite effect the opposite in the sense that the opposing magnet has big pinks and little blues and then big pinks little blues so but something I would argue like that is going on there's some just because of the geometry and how you align a magnet a magnet has more signature than just saying I'm all blue so more than all blue is coming out one end and all red is coming out the other end there's actually a pattern coming out and 
the patterns are incompatible just fundamentally and I, the, the simplest incompatibility is just to do this simple idea of this the center not matching if the centers don't match uh, then the the pattern the lack of matching between the patterns will be um, something you just can't evade all right yeah it's not perfect but uh, like I said this, so this is a real draft part just dealing with the facts um, that electric charge the monopoles can't create a pattern the magnets they're made out of atoms a collection of atoms they can create pattern and so the real trick would be is to make a really small magnet <laughs> you know very few atoms and see if it's capable of making a pattern that charge can't see you know um, so I would guess I would argue that it's probably not um, you know you need like seven atoms or something and so it's a, such a small pattern that we can't make anything small enough we can't take a small enough piece of magnet um, to see the actual effect where um, you know a charge uh, would see the pattern because the pattern is so small well it still couldn't see it but if it, if it was if I could make a, an ion again the argument would be is the ion will attract the electron or will repel the electron so you would see the the natural repulsion of charge you would see that magnets are made out of charge when you had so few atoms that there's no pattern anymore and it's we're back to the real truth that if I take an electron and a proton and I smash them together I do get all blue out of one end and all red out of the other end but when I make the more complex object out of that the magnet um, there it's it's the pattern that matters not just blue and red it's the pattern of the blue and red yeah okay so it's not as simple a magnet isn't making all a magnet isn't just electrons on the blue end and just protons on the red end it's not that simple and it makes sense that it's not that simple because it has to be you can't make proton atoms at the bottom and electron atoms at the top you know on the outside so you still have to use regular atoms so yeah it's more about a pattern than it is about um, actually diverting more force uh, that's the wrong way to say it diverting it in just two directions all right well i've sort of given you enough indication of the the facts that have to be dealt with so i'm, I'm saying this just compares to other subjects where physics just doesn't deal with anything and like with light they haven't dealt with the polarization of light they keep saying a single electron moves from a shell and it creates a whole photon when it doesn't make any sense how can it create something with a polarization that is a thousand atoms high thick wide big it's big polarization how can it create that big polarization through space I mean a photon is basically my stuff's shown it. it's a piece of paper it's an envelope flying through space very thin in one direction wide in the other direction and it has a length you know it takes time for the envelope to go through the slot to go into the atoms and have it interact with them so obviously it has to be created by more than one electron just because it's spatially has to be um, and they have never they don't deal with that that physical here it is a glaring physical fact that they just don't deal with it any way whatsoever that it just doesn't theoretically make any sense that a single photon <coughs> can pop out of a single atom and somehow gain a polarization that's huge because we can't make a photon it's just a fact you can't make a thin photon that's thin in both dimensions you know left and right left right up and down that doesn't have any dimensions in one of those two is fat there's no photon we can make that gets through two polarizing filters you know if I put the filter this way and I put the filter this way there's no photon we can make that gets through both of them so clearly photons um, can't be made by a single atom 
a single electron, uh, more specifically. It's got to be a group behavior. Like I said, that's just a... You, you can't escape it, <laughs> okay, as a, as a conclusion. It's inescapable. There's no rational explanation for how you can create... Uh, like I said, I, mean, I can just draw the picture, but I mean, how do you create something that's this size okay from something like this how does it move way over here to create this dimension and way down here to create this dimension is it can't the idea that it poofs it as a projection well then it would keep spreading and it doesn't keep spreading it's all parallel the envelope is parallel and it stays parallel flying through space it doesn't get wider the polarization doesn't spread so i mean it's you know those are facts they knew a hundred years ago and you know they still haven't dealt with them as being facts i mean how can you explain it you can't explain it waves don't explain it nothing explains it tiny little electron here in a group of thousands of atoms and somehow it moves here and then moves here to create this gigantic photon anyway um so anyway, i'm just saying this model is just so much better than their model <laughs> their model is terrible it doesn't make any sense it doesn't deal with all the facts and um you know you can doubt what i'm saying this alternative theory but you should doubt just as much their theory because it doesn't make any sense all right enough of a video so, till the next time, I'll work on this one some more, um, but um, it has occurred to me that I do have to come up with a better explanation for it's only There's only one field. I mean, really, frankly, it, all this stuff moves the same speed. The gravity, magnetism, you know, electricity in a very good conductor, all moves the same speed. So, so why are we pretending there's different things? It's all one thing. Um, and the difference just, like I said, is fundamental, is elemental. And the difference is as fundamental as the difference between an electron and a proton. That difference is also reflected in the force having the same difference. Yeah, two plus two plus two physics. Two kinds of force, two kinds of elemental matter, two kinds of interaction. You give it momentum, you don't give it momentum. All right, that's enough. I mean, all this relates to so many other subjects, like mirrors, you know, and what's actually reflected light. Um, is it light that gets converted by electrons, you know, hitting electrons, or is, it, is reflection something that happens because it, the, the energy hits a proton? And, um, you know, it's all really good questions, I think. Maybe a mirror is uh, an object that has definite orientation where the electrons are always sort of in front of the proton, so you just can't hit a proton very well. Uh, no. So now you guys start getting into chemistry and how um, geometrically atoms are shaped um, to be able to um, shield an electron. You can sort of understand that if I have six or seven electrons and I place them out here, they're going to have a lot less effect. But if I place them in close to a proton, you can sort of understand that they really do obscure it. The closer they are to the proton, the less possibility it is you can see the proton. But the further out I make them, the easier it is to see the proton. So you can sort of understand that, uh, you know, the size of atoms is as important as understanding the size of um, the electron and the protons. Yeah. All right. Until the next time and such. And so forth and whatnot.